uh, I wasn't as prepared for that. So today uh, we're going to talk primarily about this construct called a table uh, that is in the data science package that we're going to be using mostly during this course. Um, as a just to start, uh, can somebody tell me what a table is? Um, aside from the thing you eat dinner on, does anybody know what a table means? Exactly. So imagine rows and columns. You may have some experience with spreadsheets, um, you know, which is a really good example of a table. And uh, scarily enough, run probably eighty percent of the large corporations in the entire world. Um, so that's what we mean by a table, except ours are slightly more sophisticated than your average spreadsheet. But let's get into it, if I can find my mouse. Here it is. So first up, uh, homework one has been released. Uh, hopefully, you know, part, a part of the reason we release it, right, is so that you also know how things get released. So hopefully you've all seen the like notification that homework one's released. Um, but remember, we'll help you set up to actually do the homework on Friday, uh, which is now tomorrow, but for some reason I keep thinking today is Tuesday. Um, the syllabus has been updated. I can't remember what it was. Uh, you updated something, but I can't remember what. Now. Dates of labs and homework. Oh, right. So the dates for the homeworks and the labs and stuff shifted a bit uh, because of the timing of the semester. Um, and so it's been updated. Take a look uh, just in case you have that in your kind of scheduling world. Uh, so that you know that there has been a few changes, uh, nothing too drastic. All right, so here is our first question. Let's see what happens. Um, now what do I do? Start question? Start question. All right. <laughs> so this, this one's tough. Uh, please answer the question uh, with whether you're paying attention or not. Uh, and, and please do keep in mind, if you have technical issues or whatever, we will not penalize you for it for this class, uh, because I will invariably have technical challenges as well. Um, so here we go. Next answer. All right, so uh, apparently we have one person sleeping. Um, and then we had a couple of people who weren't sure which one to choose. And so they didn't answer at all. And hey, look at that. Yes was the correct answer. All right, so tying back into our last class, um, as you can see from this graph uh, that if you um, consume margarine um, over time, right? So basically uh, as you consume margarine, it is directly correlated, right? With divorce rate. So Based on this graph, is it better for your relationships to eat butter or margarine? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, or, or neither, and it makes no difference whatsoever. Or uh, if you're my son and you eat butter, you then anaphylaxis die. So always margarine. Um, so this is one of those things where we talk about, you know, Okay, there's an association, sure, but there isn't really much of a link here, right? Um, you know, they just happen to have trended the same way. So divorce rates have gone down as the consumption of margarine has gone down. Right? So you imagine that the confounding factors here are quite large, right? That there's got to be some other things going on uh, related to this. Um, uh, related, I just saw an article recently about uh, stats of divorce rates amongst um, kind of, uh, you know, traditional uh, straight, milk, uh, straight couples and, you know, versus gay and lesbian couples um, and how much lower the divorce rates are amongst basically non-traditional uh, uh, marriages, uh, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. And I want to like read more about it, but I just, it was, it was like a, a public article, right? So it was just not really the actual data. Um, but it was interesting. All right, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, like I said, we're largely going to talk about tables, um, and in, in doing so, we're going to talk about Python. Um, 
So anybody who is kind of in the software space, uh, does anyone know what the other big programming language is in the data science world? R. Okay, so basically you'll hear about a programming language called R, and it's just the letter R, um, that traditionally was a very popular language in data science, is kind of falling off because one of the things that it's good at is being a data science language, but not much good for anything else. Python, on the other hand, is pretty good at doing data science, but it's also good at a lot of other things. So as a result, you're seeing a much greater increase in the use of Python uh, for this stuff. Also, Python, um, the, the community around it, because it is open source, the community around it, their goal with the programming language is to make it accessible. So it's very easy to understand compared to many other programming languages. Um, you know, it doesn't mean it's easy, just easier to be clear. Uh, all right, so a couple of things that are weird about doing uh, kind of programming, okay? I, and I don't know how weird it actually is, but this is one of those things where if you practice it, you get better at it. It is very, very difficult to get better at it by just watching others do it, okay? So much like music, you know, if you've ever done, you know, an instrument or you ever sang or anything like that, um, you know, you have some teacher at some point, right, who said on the regular, you must practice, you must practice, you must practice. Programming is very like that, okay? The more you do it, the more you get, you know, the better you get at it. Uh, and uh, we often refer in the tech industry as what's called muscle memory. So your fingers will start to know what you need next almost before your brain does uh, because you've done it so many times, which if you've ever done music, I think sometimes happens there too. You kind of just, your fingers just know how to play the next note uh, eventually, right? If you get enough practice. Um, related or similar to that is that as you stop practicing, you, your, your ability drops off too. So just the reason I mentioned this is because that's why we have so many like homeworks and labs and stuff like that is because the more you practice, the better at it you'll get. And, and the goal here for this class, right, is to give you the experience with it and to kind of make it almost second nature for you. Um, way more than it is to give you a grade, right? What we want you to do is we want you to learn this stuff and we want you to enjoy it and we want you to find it interesting. Um, and the best way to do that is, is just lots of practice. All right. Um, so uh, I like, uh, you know, my slides definitely still need more cats um, and I apologize for the lack of cats, but let me just open the right window. Oops, which I am definitely not doing correctly. Come on. Sorry, somehow the, the window got closed and now I can't find the window I'm looking for. Oh, here it is. All right, so I will probably be trying to awkwardly switch between uh, browser windows. Um, but so a lot of the class going forward is kind of me showing you stuff while kind of doing it. Um, and what we'll do before the class starts is distribute. You'll see um, they'll be kind of conveniently named. So the, the one I distribute will usually be called lec for lecture, then the number or whatever number we're on. And then it'll usually say class. So I haven't distributed this one because I don't expect it to be in Jupyter Notebooks yet. Um, but starting on Tuesday, please start to come with the expectation that you have a Jupyter Notebook set up and uh, that you've opened the lecture so that you can kind of follow along. And again, going back to that practice remark, 
if you follow along, it, it's more practice, right? Um, and, you know, we will distribute uh, the, the correct ones, you know, like the complete ones at the end of every lecture. Uh, this is something we, we didn't realize to do until late in the semester, last semester, but it is definitely something we should be doing. So we will release the kind of correct ones at the end of the lecture. So if you're not able to follow along uh, because I'm going too fast or something like that, that's totally fine. But as much as you can keep up, the better, uh, as well as uh, like periodically, I'll ask you questions. And if you have the notebook there, you can try your answer before giving it, right? So you can say, oh, you know, I think this is how to do it. Let me type it in and see if it works, right? Make sense? All right. So uh, the first thing we're going to show is this part up here, which I think I explained last time or the time before. Um, but just, you know, for the sake of argument, right, you can kind of ignore that top block, but you do need to run it. Um, and my example was, you know, if you're a construction company and you have a carpenter, the carpenter is not going to bring all of the tools that the construction company owns to every job. They're only going to bring the ones they need. So what we're doing here is we're saying out of the universe of Python tools, these are the ones we're going to use. Uh, and it, towards later in the semester, we will talk a little bit more about what those are. Uh, one thing I will point out, though, because I like to give the props out. Has anybody here ever heard of 538? Do you know what it is? You want to tell me? Um, it's the, um, yeah, well, among other things, but basically uh, a, a team of data scientists who generally publish information around election results um, or, you know, or polling in advance of elections, et cetera. 538 is a reference to the number of members of Congress, I think. It might be the House reps, but I think it's Congress in general. Um, but that's, that's where the number comes from, but that's the name of the organization. They have created a bunch of nice tools for making things look pretty uh, and have made them open source so we can use them in this class. Um, so that's why I like to give out the props. Uh, and then we'll also be using this data science library or tool, right, toolbox <coughs> coming from uh, Berkeley School. Um, sorry, the University of California, Berkeley, not the one that's down the street. Um, and uh, basically, it's a bunch of uh, things that make data science stuff a little bit easier to do, including the table thing we're going to talk about. So first and foremost, what can we do with this stuff? Well, we can get 2 plus 9, right? Uh, for any of you in here, um, I think maybe I talked about this. It's like, I'm actually pretty good at math. I'm not good at arithmetic, OK? So I, I will use a computer almost all the time when I need to do things like 2 plus 9. Um, so uh, you can, generally speaking, in a Jupyter Notebook, just kind of type in what you want, OK? So if you want to add two numbers together, you put a plus sign in between them. So as if you were writing them on paper, except that you don't have to solve. Um, now, there's a couple of cryptic things, which is where the letters on the keyboard don't kind of, where's my mouse, uh, don't kind of map terribly well to Okay, come on. Like, I'm definitely having a day here. Sorry. Um, where the letters on the keyboard don't map very well to uh, the letters or the, the character that we would use uh, to represent that thing in the real world. Um, this one in particular is one example. So instead of using a, an X, right, or a dot that you might have learned in some math class somewhere along the way, you use an asterisk to indicate multiplication. What's funny about this is that this has now been in use so long in programming that you often see it in the real world too. Um, but when I was taught math, for example, I was taught multiplication with either a dot, right, or a, like an X. Uh, but in Python and most programming languages, you can use an asterisk, which is the real name of what a lot of people call a star. And so, but we just type it in and now we can do that little bit of math. Uh, and we get, you know, two times nine is 18. Um, and then another one that we'll show you is, uh, like I said, another weird character. So this is a division symbol, okay? So, um, and it, if you think about fractions, it's actually, it kind of comes from that. But again, we can't really put that bar in very well, right? Or a little like, you know, twist thing. So we use a slash to indicate division. 
And so two divided by nine is obviously 0 0.2 repeating. Uh, and we go on from there. Um, but then we can get more complex and we can say, you know, two times three times nine, um, you know, and oops, but I could type correctly and not have errors. So it's the hard part about where I can't see what I'm actually typing. Um, and so we can do, you know, kind of more extensive multiplications, but then we can also introduce parentheses. Okay. So um, one of the things that you find in programming is that order of operations thing. Uh, did anybody learn like a, a, what do they call it? A mnemonic for remembering the order of operations? Uh, what was it? PEMDAS. Okay. So what's funny about that is that that acronym has changed since I was a kid. I don't know how that happened exactly. Um, but so remembering that, uh, which, you know, may be lost in the, your memory, uh, will be handy because sometimes, you know, you need to use uh, like parentheses to indicate what you want to have happen first. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not that hard. It just might be something that you'd have to refresh your memory on. But so then, you know, we can completely change this equation by doing, you know, plus, right? Uh, and so because I use parentheses, actually the multiplication would happen first anyway, but you get the idea is that I can introduce parentheses just like plus sign or multiplication sign or anything like that. Uh, and it does what you would expect. Um, this is one that is uh, particularly tricky for me. Um, but uh, does anyone have any ideas about how you might raise something to a power? Use two asterisks, you're correct. Why I find this confusing is because um, I think it should be a carrot, right? It means like go up there, right? Um, but it's not, uh, and a carrot does something completely different. So. Uh, this one is one to remember and one I am regularly caught by. Uh, so if we do two asterisks in a row, um, and what's that for? Then we can do, you know, basically exponents. Uh, and, and you can put anything arbitrary you want in there for any part of it. Um, you know, all of these pieces fit together. You can do whatever kind of arbitrary math. Um, and let's see what's next. Um, all right, so now we want to introduce, oops something kind of different, which is when we do something like this, okay? So this is how we indicate, indicate a string. And we're gonna talk about a string more in a second. Oops, I threw a key. Um, but now we've entered, instead of just like a number, we've actually introduced like letters into a thing. And so now the, uh, you know, Python interpreter knows that you know, this thing that you asked for here, this is what it looks like to it, okay? So it's kind of like the result of the math. But let's switch the slides so that it will make hopefully more sense. And I don't know why my computer is so busy. Sorry. All right. So that was a bit of the math. And now we want to talk about names, OK? So as you might imagine, if I have to do something with 2 plus 3 a whole bunch of times, I don't want to write 2 plus 3 every time, right? Or let's make it more complicated, you know, parentheses 2 plus 3, parentheses, you know, uh, divided by 36, multiplied by 29. I don't want to have to write all that every time I need to use it if I need to use that a whole bunch of times. So what I do is I actually give it a name, okay? So in this case, um, we're going to give a name of hours per week. So imagine like somebody, you know, this is how many hours there are in a week. And we're going to assign that to 24 by uh, times 7, okay? So that's the number of hours in a week. And then we can just carry around that number with that name, okay? So now, anytime I type this set of letters, it will give me whatever the result of that multiplication is. That makes sense? And that's what we do with a name. Um, 
Yeah, and so and the, the key thing though to remember is that the name is bound to the result, okay, or the 24 times 7 is the result of that, not the 24 times 7 itself. Does that make sense? So it's always bound to the result, not the things that made up the result. And we can show some names, hopefully. So just uh, by way of, uh, you know, kind of open kimono, right? I have a cheat sheet over here that I reference while I'm trying to type the stuff over there so that I don't screw it up as badly as I would normally. Um, so that's why I look down at my computer a lot. So what we do is we're going to say, let's assign this name, just the letter A, to the number four. Okay. So what do we think that? If I execute this, just this letter, what will I get? All right, how about this? Everybody raise your hand with the number of fingers you think it will be. All right, hopefully that was a pretty, a pretty serious give me right there. Um, so you're correct, so it's a four, right? And now for the entire rest of this time that I'm using this, that A will be equal to four. Unless I tell it to be something else. Yeah. What if you're typing a word like week? It's on the screen eight and nine. Does not supersede. It does not. So so the A is the full name. So if you if you used another word that happened to have A in it, that whole thing is the full name. So that's actually a really good question. I never thought about that before. But yes, that is definitely not what's going to happen. They're two completely different logical things. Um, because You've got to kind of forget the fact that it's an A. Just it's just a label, right? It's just a thing you're slapping on it, um, and so it doesn't really have to do with the fact that it's an A. So I can even show you. Um, but I can never remember what the keystroke is for adding a thing. Um, so I can say, let's just try. Would you say wheat, right? Um, so as you can see. Wheat is undefined. So I haven't told the computer what wheat should be, even though it does have an A embedded in it. All right, so now we can uh, do nothing apparently. Actually, let me just do a few of them. Okay, so now we can take another label and say, let's make that nine to be kind of semi consistent with the stuff above. Um, and now we have the B is labeled like or a nine is labeled as B. Okay, so if we just execute the B, we will get a nine again. But now we can do things with A and B. Okay, or we can do uh, A times three or three uh, until we get twelve, right? Because A is equal to four. Uh, or we can also start to do cool things like A times. B um, and case matters, right? So this B and this B are not the same, okay? Because again, forget about the fact that it's a B, you know? Uh, can you all see this? I can make it bigger. Okay. It's one of those things, it's like, I can see it just fine. How's that, better? More? Okay. Um, so as you can see, so because it's, it's just a label, right? So and case matters, this B and that B are not the same thing, okay? And I can prove it by typing in B. And again, it doesn't know what B is, but if I type in the little B, uh, we get the number that it was, you know, the label. Um, one thing about kind of programming in general, uh, programmers tend to favor lowercase things most of the time. So I will literally, because, you know, hitting that shift key that's a lot of extra effort, you know, so we usually favor the lowercase. Um, in fact, if you send me emails or whatever, the likelihood you get uh, like um, in my signature uh, uh, it back with a capital L is very low. That's usually because I inserted my signature. But if I, you know, if I typed it, it's going to be lowercase. So uh, let's see, moving on to more stuff about names. Um, but, you know, I think is been 
or maybe obvious by now, but a name can be anything, right? So we, we said wheat before, but let's say total equals A times B. And now we can see that total is 36, right? It is now that net value is changed. However, let's say I make A equal to 27. And actually, we put them in the same line. Um, and now, if I print total, let's print A and total. I think this will print. Eh, it didn't print the A. But so A has now been changed to be 27, but total is the same because it's just the value, the result, right? It doesn't keep track of what it used to be. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me just print A to kind of show you. A has been changed to 27, but the total is still the same because it doesn't change. It doesn't track what it used to be. All right. So, and here we go. We have another question. Oh, wait. <laughs> you can't actually see the other question. Sorry. All right. So, in the example I just gave, what is this blank here? What what is that thing on the left hand side called? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess you're you're supposed to just answer it here. I'm so used to doing things out loud. Um, so just answer it on the thing. Look, we have 32 and 55. Click that button. Um, I was mostly just trying to explain the question. Um, it'd be nice if that picture was taken, you know. Oh, okay. All right, it's faster clicking. All right, so. How do I say go? Okay, so we had a couple of different answers here. Um, so what I've been calling it is a name. And the reason I call it a name is because that's the formal name, sorry, name of this kind of thing. It is a, it is a name uh, in a kind of general programming worldness that is often, often referred to as a variable. We'll talk about that later, um, or a label. Um, but the technical word that we used was name. So the name was the correct answer on this one. Although, you know, you definitely get partial credit for variable and label. Um, then, let's see. So we'll go back to the uh, Python again. Um, and I talked about this a little bit, but let's talk about it for real. And this one I'm gonna cut and paste because otherwise I will invariably have massive typos. So again, when we want to track something, it's sometimes a lot easier to have a name for that. Thing. Um, and what it also does is it makes it easier for the person who's coming along later to understand what you meant. Okay. So, you know, the number 40 is just the number 40. You have no idea that that 40 is meant to work, uh, represent the typical hours that people work in a week in the US. Um, if you want to work less than that, you can move to Finland, I think, which is now going to 32, but in the US, it tends to be 40. So, but a 40 can be anything, right? It's 40 of anything. So, in this case, we're talking about hours per week. And that makes it a little clearer. So then we can say, okay, what is the value? What we want to figure out is 
let's say how many hours you have to work in a year when you work 52 weeks and 40 hours per week. No vacations here. And so now we have another label that now actually have our hours per year. And the other reason I wanted to uh, kind of get that correct is because now I can get uh, completion. Uh, assuming I can type anything. And so the total number of hours that people can, you know, people in the US work in a year is 2080. Uh, the normal number is actually 2000 because most people have two weeks vacation. But now we can calculate that out. And now we have it in a label again. So now, or a name, sorry. Now, now I'm mixing myself up because I saw the other word. Um, but it, we have it in a name. So again, we can use it. We know what it is. Um, and we can make it clear either to the next person or to ourselves two weeks from now when we forget what we were doing. Um, so if we then can do something like, uh, what is the minimum wage for uh, Massachusetts, right? So minimum wage is a concept that we have in the US where you can't get paid less than that, you know, unless you are a waiter, um, but you get the idea. So you have this thing called min wage, Oh my goodness. And I think, does anybody know what it is? I think it's 13 or 1250? 14. 14. Um, so uh, I apologize for not remembering, but it did very recently change. So that's why I was a little uh, confused. Um, so now we can do cool things like we can say, okay, what is the typical weekly wage by giving that a name? And we say hours per week times min wage, not ampersand, but times. And if I remember, I'm going to start remembering to put in that so you can see what the result is. Um, but so now we can calculate what's the weekly wage using hours per week times the minimum wage. Yeah. Didn't the bank get better when you were probably doing that? Yeah. So technically, no, they do not. You can usually get rid of spaces. But Python's a little weird about this in that most of the time. So generally speaking, if I wasn't typing on air, um, I would put in spaces. It makes it more legible. And it's it's like all the time spaces are correct. Some of the time you can get rid of things. You can get uh, away with getting rid of them. So generally speaking, it's good policy in Python to put in, like this is a, a I, I would go back and fix this uh, if I wasn't just kind of live demo. And then of course, does anybody have any ideas about how we would get, let's say, what's the yearly wage for somebody who makes minimum wage? What would we type in? So first thing I'll do is yearly wage and then yeah, back there. Weekly wage times what? Weeks per year. Oh, I forgot again. Oh my goodness. So somebody who's making $14 per hour and they are actually working for 2,080 hours altogether. Um, or if maybe they get paid weekly. In fact, in the US, most of the time you actually get paid by the hour. So technically speaking, we should actually be hours per year times the um, the uh, minimum wage, but you know, it's close enough. So, but the yearly wage is uh, $29,120. And so we can figure it out. And we also know because of all those nice names, we know what it means, right? All right. So Let's go back to the slides and talk. Actually, no, we want to go to the uh, functions again here. Which I set up poorly. All right, so 
it would be really annoying if every time we wanted to do like kind of any operation that's a little more sophisticated, if we had to do it by hand, right? So what we get in Python is a whole bunch of things that are built in. Um, who here knows what an absolute value is? Exactly. So, so you know, the, in the in poor man, you know, in the layman's uh, vernacular, right? It's you drop the negative sign. But technically speaking, it's the distance from zero that a number is irrelevant of the distance. So uh, that is a common thing to want to be able to do while you're programming um, for various reasons. But as a result, um, built into Python is what's called a function. And in this case, again, because we're lazy, it's abs for absolute value um, because nobody wants to write absolute value every time. Uh, and it's pretty consistently ABS in most languages most of the time. Uh, so, and it does exactly what you expect. Right. Uh, and kind of tying back in the name thing, we can say, you know, abs value of five and do abs negative five. And now we can also put it in a name, which again, I forgot to print. Um, And now it's just that five, right? So we can keep, you know, you can kind of use it wherever you want to. Um, but then we can also get slightly more sophisticated in that we can also pass constructs into the math function as well, or into the whatever function we want to use. Um, so one minus three is obviously negative two. We pass it to abs and we get a positive two. So one of the things that I like to think about this as is when you're calling a method, it's kind of like the thing inside in the friends is PEMDAS, okay? So in other words, this thing inside here is gonna happen before the abs happen, right? So as a result, it does the one minus three and gets negative two and passes that to the abs method, not individually or, you know, I don't know, some confusing way. But so if you kind of imagine these parentheses as PEMDAS, it's logical. Okay, does that make sense? And then uh, we, of course, can pass names in there as well. However, for the sake of uh, you all ever leaving because I can't type to save my life, um, we can pass names in too, just like we would any other number, because for all intents and purposes, these names are the same as the actual numbers. So we can pass those in to the absolute value. And in this case, we're gonna subtract 40 or 52 from 47 and get a negative five. Um, and we pass it to absolute value and we get uh, just a plain five. Uh, another function we'll talk about, and the reason we're talking about these is because you use them all the time. Um, and I do wanna see how we're doing on time. So the next one I was going to introduce is anybody have a guess as to what this function might do or what the real name of it is? Minimum, exactly. So what do you think the result's going to be? 14, right on. So when you're doing data science, right, or you're doing data analysis, you're trying to explore that data, it's very useful a lot of the time to know what kind of the bottom most value is. And so that's why something like min is really useful. Uh, does anybody have a guess what might be useful as well? Max. And because either you have done programming before or because you started to get that sense of uh, programmers are super lazy, both of these are short forms of the, of the thing, right? So maximum, minimum, um, and we type in the same thing, we get two different answers, right? All right, so then another one that's very, very common is, oops, in the wrong place. We wanna do rounding um, because that would also be super annoying to have to do all the time. And so we do rounding 
And so rounding does by default kind of what you expect. It rounds it to a whole number. Um, but you can also be cooler about it if you want something slightly different and you can pass it what's actually called another argument like a one. And in this case, it will now give us one digit to the right of the decimal. Okay. And so it does the rounding, but the rounding stays correct, right? So instead of four, it actually rounded the five, right? And made the four into a five. So it's 123.5 rather than 0.4. It's not just slicing it off, it's actually rounding. All right. Now let's go back to the slides and kind of talk about this in a little bit more kind of formal sense. So here's kind of the anatomy of that whole expression. Uh, notice my cool, cool mind, mind box. So expression is kind of a, a you know, a real important word. Um, so that's something you should try to remember the definition of. These are expressions. So like everything you write is an expression in Python. Um, and then function, so here in this case, we just have this arbitrary function called f because function um, and just meant to imply that it could be anything, right? So this is min or max or round or, or you know, some function that you make. Um, and so that's what the f is. Uh, and then these are what are called arguments to the function. Now, where it's a little bit confusing is it is common to, to call a function a method. So they're kind of, they're synonymous. Um, and kind of depending on what programming language you like grew up with, you will uh, choose one word over the other. So I will tend to say method, but I mean the same thing as function. Okay. And then argument also has the same problem, which is uh, the other common synonym for it is uh, parameter. Okay. So if you hear me say parameter or argument, I mean the same thing. It's whatever it is you're passing in to the function or the method. And I may have more than one argument, as you saw with the round, right? I passed it two. I said, here's the number I want for the round, and here's how many decimal places I want. Um, and yeah, and so, and this is how you phrase it when you want to talk about it. Okay. So I'm going to call, you know, insert method name on insert argument name. All right. And then kind of getting into that a little bit more. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I actually have the slide. So as you can see, right, first argument, second argument, um, and we'll get the maximum of those two. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll skip this demo and move on. Um, and then start to talk about tables. All right, so a table, and what I want to point, or what I want to point out here is, if you notice, this table here is capitalized. So that's both, in a sense, the English capitalization, because we're talking about a specific thing called a table, but also because in Python we have this construct called a table that is a capital T. Okay. So unlike being in Max or whatever, the all lowercase table, whenever we use that, is actually going to be capitalized. Um, so. In the table, as we somebody over here said earlier, um, you know we have rows and we have columns, um, and we have what we usually refer to as a label for that column. Okay, um, and so you know this whole series is called codes, or like in this case it happens to be state codes, but you know codes, and then this whole it, it column is called areas. Um, in this case, in meters squared. Um, and then we have it for say every state, right? Make sense? All right. Um, now, one of the other kind of keywords that we want to find out is the word attribute or attribute, depending on where you grew up, um, which is any one of these things. So the, I'm going to say state code because I think we should say state code. Uh, the state code attribute of California is CA. Okay. The area, uh, you know, meters squared attribute of California is uh, 163,000 and a bunch. Okay. 
Okay. So I want to make sure you know the terminology because we'll use them a lot. Um, and if, if you don't know what the terms mean, right, it's very hard to follow along. All right. So now let's look at using a table. And this is where we get into a little bit more kind of data science because we actually have data. So the first thing, let me just do that so I have some place to type, is we have, um, actually, let me just open it. We have a table, right? But it's really just a file, you know, with some text in it that has flavors of ice cream, the color of that flavor, and then the price. Okay. So what we do is we want to make a table with a capital T, right? So that that object inside of uh, uh, Python uh, out of that file. So now we have in this name cones a column called flavor, a column called color, and a column called price. So attributes of this individual row of each individual item. And now we can manipulate it. Um, and scroll in my cheat sheet. So first up, we can do things like, all right, I don't actually want to see all of them because imagine there was like 10,000 different ice cream flavors. Um, so maybe what I want to do is just show me two of the rows, okay? But one of the nice things is this particular uh, you know, structure that we're using is it actually tells you how many it's not showing you. Uh, so you can get a sense of how big the thing you're messing with is. Um, and then what we can also do is, let's say we only want to look at one attribute, we can say cone select and say flavor. And I'll point out two things here. The capitalization of the name of the of the column or the attribute is important. Okay, so if I put lowercase f, it may not work. All right, so make sure it's the same as what you think it should be, or what, as in what it is. Um, and then the other example we like to give here is that it still needs to be. I feel like I missed the slide. Um, it still needs to be a string. Oops. So. What's going to happen if I do this? Any ideas? You're going to get an error, right? Because I just gave it a name that doesn't have anything. Okay. So I could solve this, even though it's kind of a terrible idea, by doing this. And then I can say cones dot select flavor. And that should work because now I have labeled the name flavor on flavor, right? So this seems like kind of a terrible idea, right? Because you could just easily name flavor to be uh, whatever it was, color, and it would still work, except it gives you a different call, right? So you want to make sure your names actually mean what. They say they mean. Um, and so in this case, it's probably a better idea to actually just put in this string called flavor. Um, and like I said, yeah, I didn't do the string slide though, I feel like. Okay. So so there's the table. Let me see if there's uh, another thing I wanted to point out about it. Um, Okay, and so then I can also do further manipulation, right? So I can, now that I have this construct that is this table, I can do cool things like, okay, I don't care about the price. So I wanna see the table where everything, you know, doesn't show me the price because that's not interesting to the, the experiment or the thing I wanna know. So I can drop the price column, okay? And, and these keywords are uh, very common. So select means, you know, grab a column, 
drop means lose a column. Um, and they should be pretty consistent uh, kind of across the board from a language perspective. So then, but then I can actually assign that thing to a new name, right? So I can oops, copy that and we'll say uh, cones without price. And we can actually assign it there. And if I print it, it'll probably make it a little clearer. But now we have a table that is called cones without price. Okay, so we've actually like permanently dropped it. But if you notice, right, as we were talking about before, cone seems to be unchanged, right? It is unchanged because I dropped it up here, right? But it's still here when I call it again. So this operation here, right, it hasn't changed cone because that was a label on the table or the name on the table. Um, so it's only when I get this new name that it doesn't have the price in it. And then we can also do another handy thing where let's say we want to know about a particular um, row in the table, or you know we want to we want to look for a particular thing. So we're going to look for this flavor of chocolate, and we want to know you know maybe what the color options are and what the price options are. So apparently we have three different chocolates, and one of them is light brown, but two of them are still dark brown. They have and they even have different prices. So sometimes they have, or I'm sorry, same prices. Um, so sometimes it, we may have, uh, you know, a table or whatever that actually all the attributes are the same. So we can have re repetition, and that's something to keep in mind, right? If you're trying to like count all the cone types, you know, or all the ice cream types, does this count as two or one? Right? It'll depend on the what you're trying to analyze. So just keep that in mind that it may not be unique, um, and we can also do cool things like we can sort on a particular subject. So we can sort by, say, price, which seems logical. So maybe I can type it correctly. Um, and so now it'll be price sorted. Uh, however, you might want to think about it as the most expensive one versus to the cheapest, right? Instead of cheapest to the most expensive, which is what it'll do by default. Um, and so the way we do that is we do cones.sort price and we use a second argument. However, in this case, we're using a second argument. It's like we're passing in two, except we're saying specifically, this is the argument we want to mess with called descending. So we're going to say cones.sort price descending. Um, and we're going to say descending is true. And so now we'll get this thing in the basically the reverse order, right? So where the most expensive one is at the top. And so let's, yeah. So then we can also start to talk about maybe a slightly more interesting table. And so what we have is another file that has a whole mess of skyscrapers and some attributes about those skyscrapers. And these are the various buildings, right? The Empire State Building, you've probably all heard of. Um, what it's made out of is steel, where it is in New York City, how tall is it, um, and then when was it completed? So what if we want to know, right, um, you know, something about uh, the skyscrapers but in this case, let's say we just want to look at, let me copy this so I'm less likely to make mistakes. Let's say we want to know what all the skyscrapers are in New York City. Right, and so this is the list. Um, there's actually 63 and then by default, this will be 10. So there's going to be 73 in this table of skyscrapers that are in New York City. And now we can we can operate on just that if we want to, or we can say, hey, let's go find some particular thing. That's why this, this where thing is very power, powerful, where we can say, you know what, let's actually look for a particular 
skyscraper, and we'll take the example from before, the Empire State Building. And assuming I spelled it correctly, um, we can find just that one particular reference to get that individual detail out, you know, because in case, in some cases, right, the one we wanted may not have appeared in our first easy search results, and we wanted to go find the individual one that we're looking for. Um, and then lastly, for now, we can kind of combine these things together. So, and the way you combine them together is by just kind of continuing on. So I think this is a, a difficult construct if you haven't seen it before. So when I, when I do this where, right, what happens is I get essentially a new table that is just the Empire State Building, okay? Or in the one above, I get a new table which is just the skyscrapers of New York City. But it's not assigned to any name, right? But that doesn't mean it's not there. So it's there, and so what I can actually do is I can then run a command against the result here, okay? And sort that itself by just kind of, uh, kind of just keep adding on to the end of it because we know each time you're getting a new table that has the, just the results that you were looking for before. So now we can sort all the New York City skyscrapers in terms of when they were completed and conveniently it's the oldest to the newest in this case. Okay, because it's going to sort those numbers in an ascending order. But we can also do the same thing we did before and reverse the sort by doing sending is true. I'm assuming I typed it correctly. Um, and now we do it in reverse. So now we have, you know, apparently this data is from 2015 or before, or, you know, right around 2015. And so that's when the uh, most recent skyscraper is according to this set of skyscrapers, right? So talking about the tables a little bit more formally, I think. So just to kind of summarize the things that we met with there, right? So we get select, which gives us a new table with just the columns that we chose. So I only showed you doing one column, but you can just put a comma there and do other columns as well. Um, and then you can drop and you can do the same thing. You can do multiple columns um, and get a new table that just has the kind of columns you care about. Um, and then sort, you can order them. You can also sort in descending versus ascending order. Um, so we have a theory, what would happen if I sort uh, in like an alphabetic column what happens if I do descending? Right, what will be the what will be the first row? Like what letter? Not not an actual example. Right, exactly. So ascending would be A to Z, and descending is Z to A. Um, and then where is kind of really powerful for when you want to kind of narrow in on a particular row, because most of these are column operations, right? And then this one is more of a row operation where you say, okay, I want the rows back that match this condition. Okay. Let's see. Do we have another question? Yes, I think we do. Okay. So if you only want one specific question, question, if you want only one specific column, uh, which one would you choose? Okay, um, I don't think I like I think we can get to the other slides next time, so I might do the rest of the questions and we'll call it from there. Are they all about tables mostly? Okay. Right, this class is over at 45, right? Yeah, okay. All right, not bad.
And so mostly correct. Um, so select is what we were looking for. So this, you know, we want to we want to select a particular column or set of columns in order to uh, you know make a new table that only has the columns we care about or the attributes we care about. Um, all right, so let's see, we have another question. So if we wanna get rid of a, uh, a row from a table, which operation would we do? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead from there. Um, can you see the results? I I can't tell how many times I have to click it to be able to get the results. Um, so this was my uh, I think this was I find it a little confusing. So, um, but this is essentially the correct answer in the sense that you take the table, you use drop, and then you tell it which column you want. Um, there's also a bug up here where that should be columns in the formula. So, so we won't count that one against you if you got it incorrect. Um, but that's cool. So we'll do another one and then we'll be almost done. All right, so what is it that we call the title of each of the columns? So, um, oh, sorry, no, this is a matching, right? So, uh, so what do we call, which thing here is a row, which thing is a label, which thing is a column? I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. Works pretty well. We get everybody to get typed faster though. Other than that. All right, 52, we got six left. Click, click. All right, let's see how you did. All right, so the most popular order was row, column, label. So what I can say is this is a row going across the number one, and then this is a column number two, so like going up and down. And then the the thing that names the column is a label or number three. And it looks like that's what most people got. Cool. All right. Do we get another one? Do we have another question? Oh, that was the correct answer. All right. So yeah, so we'll talk about kind of the formal definition of numbers and strings. I thought those slides were earlier, so I apologize. Um but we'll we'll talk about that kind of in a little bit more detail. Like, what is a number? Like, what's the difference between like a four and a one twenty three point two? Um, and like, you know, the letters in a string and how that stuff works. Uh, I think next time, because we are almost at time, and I don't want to start this subject and then like have to kill it halfway through. Um, any questions so far?